Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you into the weekend. It is the first weekend in March. I got first Friday clips. I got a, a an extra special dub and stuff. I also got some uh, um, first Friday uh, art guy for you guys looking to do something tonight in your downtown walk. Uh, first Friday is a great way to get invested in the Missoula community, in the art community, and stuff like that. Um, let, let, let's go, let's talk about some news and then we'll jump right in. All right, so gas prices, uh, they jumped from uh, 344 a gallon yesterday to 359 this morning. Not a good sign when Biden, during the State of the Union address, said he and Europe have released 60 million barrels of reserve oil as the Ukraine war goes on. Ukraine, 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 so much happening. And just as Friday came around, CDC, one of the uh, quietest headlines to basically remove the masking recommendation for communities that have low risk and being 70% vaccinated in the U.S., it's about time. Missoula has been seeing uh, falling numbers with even fewer uh, in hospital. Um, I checked uh, the database earlier this week and it turned out there was only six uh, people in the hospital with COVID-related things, and most of them are from outside the city of Missoula. The Missoula Public Library has seen less and less staff wearing masks and AP News followed up the report basically saying that the healthy Americans take off their masks as well. Target in Missoula, um, uh, the store was one of the first stores around Missoula and also made the news to let their staff without masks last week and the trend spread throughout the community. Um, in a library report from this week, they offered library staff worried about COVID-19 to have the ability to work from home and if they fall under a pre-existing condition for health reasons, aka co comorbidities. The University of Montana also moved from the mandate to, rec to recommendations starting March 3rd, and most of the required individuals are those in close contact, fresh off of traveling, non-vaccinated individuals. Most importantly, to stress those who get sick in gen general are masking up and or staying home. Of course, I really believe that we should have dropped a trend that has uh, sick people, you know, stay home. Um, a lot of times uh, we've got this uh, ideology in America, especially to work through the pain, work through uh, sicknesses a lot of times. I'm thinking that hopefully this uh, pandemic may uh, have taught us that it's important to uh, mitigate our own spread of uh, diseases through our, our own community. So I wanted to kind of leave it on that, but this is kind of the, the heels of spring break being sprung this week in Missoula. It rained on Monday and it was pretty much uh, fairly wet all week long, warmer temperatures. I, I keep on hearing that there's going to be another freeze coming up, which seems about right for Missoula, especially around the March time, because there's always at least one more freeze before we truly get into the spring months, but I'm really seeing a lot of uh, warmer weathers. Uh, this morning it was very nice. Uh, it, it was wet on the ground. It wasn't really frozen outside. So winter and mild uh, summers. Well, in eastern Montana, they are usually exposed to more of the open air. So we've had uh, snow in June, Great Falls uh, during uh, <laughs> during uh, winter months, especially different times. But anyways, uh, we probably should talk a little bit more about Russia and just kind of, I, I put basically a lot of information just to kind of pinpoint different things that have been very kind of like happening and the things that have been highlighted pretty much all week long and just kind of putting in little notes here and there. Um, so anyways, uh, let's see. The Russian currency, ruble, has plummeted as international banks have begun closing. Uh, SWIFT uh, pulled their assets to prevent any kind of connection for uh, um, bank transfers for any Russian citizens. Unfortunately, Putin and the Kremlin have the money hidden in assets, and so far reports from the U.S. intelligence indicate Russia can't sustain themselves with, uh, outside the world's economy for at least a year, um, taking into account that uh, Putin also has a billion-dollar mansion. Okay, let's get back to Ukraine. A couple things I wanted to highlight uh, over the flyover of Russia. Um, the president came out Monday announcing that, uh, you, know, f you know, the president of Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, he came out and said that, more than 4,500 Russian troops have been killed, but that has since been uh, completely debunked. But uh, the Russia has confirmed earlier this week that five, uh, uh, 498 soldiers have died. Uh, soldiers that are either uh, so, so basically, okay, I'm kind of getting off uh, the script. So, uh, so th there's just definitely a lot going on. A lot of fighting soldiers in the military. Uh, a lot of men aged 16 to 60 are told to stay behind in Ukraine and fight. Um, there was an assassination attempt earlier on Tuesday, according to Telegram message. Uh, Defense Council Chief Olaski Denov says that the uh, uh, un uh, unit of elite Chechen special forces, known as the 
Kedarovitz uh, had been behind the plot and had sub subsequently been eliminated from Tuesday. The Ukrainian troops on Zemir Island, known as the known as Snake Island, told a Russian warship to bleep off. Uh, they th there was reports that they were killed, but there's also other reports that came out on Sunday that says that they have been simply captured after a bombardment ensued. Uh, the ghost of Kaviv, uh, that could have been uh, that th that was something kind of going on as well. They said that it was the 21st century's first flying ace. Uh, they said that they shot down six Russian aircrafts. Unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, evidence saying that this is particularly fake and it's made it to unite the Rush, the Ukrainian people and scare the Russians. Uh, so just, just a lot of different things happening here. Uh, soldiers that uh, bombed himself. Uh, this one actually did happen. Generals hailed the sacrifice of Van Vanili Shakun Vol uh, Vladimirovich uh, for halting a column of Russian tanks in Haichin, a, a southern uh, Kyrgyzstan region. Sorry, I'm really butchering a lot of these names. Of course, according to his brothers in arms, Videli got in touch with them as he said he was going to blow the, up the bridge immediately after an explosion rang out. Kharkiv, one of the, uh, the second largest cities um, in Ukraine. Um, Ukrainian uh, folks have been uh, pushing back of, and uh, having many small victories against Russian troops. However, uh, the Russia has uh, recently bombarded missiles and cluster bombs, which were made illegal back in 2008 uh, from the Geneva Conventions. Uh, of course, the first battles were won by Ukraine, but major forces and pressure being laid down resulted in the current occupancy. Um, Kviv, which is the capital of uh, Ukraine, the uh, Russian forces are targeting the capital and have been bombing the city, different locations. U.S. As, uh, asked President Vladimir Zelensky if he needs to be evacuated. Zelensky, he needs bullets, not a ride. Uh, that's one of the popular uh, quotes that are going around. He's really uniting the nation. A lot of uh, media outlets are hailing him as a hero. He's in a very tough spot trying to ask for as much support as he can from his Western allies uh, at this point, especially since uh, one of the big things that uh, mo uh, that uh, Zelensky also moved forward with was uh, signing papers to join the EU, something that the Ukrainians had no uh, invested interest in doing until this uh, sudden invasion. Uh, regular posts from the capital from Pre President Zelensky has been going on social media every single morning. He's been calling many different president leaders and all stuff, stuff like that. And uh, speaking of other uh, folks as well, um, um, so one of the things is that there's a 20-mile uh, convoy to the north is keeping folks in uh, Kiev on edge as well. Um, such shots of uh, blockades and unarmed Ukrainian people using themselves as human shields and waving uh, Ukrainian flags. The muddy ground, this is a very uh, wet time in Ukraine right now, so uh, a lot of the convoys have to stay on the roads and a lot of their uh, tires have been, so there's just been a lot of uh, reportings back and forth. The, the convoy is constantly growing. I haven't heard too much. This is a constantly uh, fluid kind of idea, so I just also wanted to talk about the civilians, the ones who are impacted the most. Um, and over the weekend, saw 120,000 refugees that left Ukraine over the last five days. Uh, 500,000 people left Ukraine, and then officially, uh, now we're getting into a pretty much a more than a week into this uh, crisis, this invasion, this war. There's now more than a million refugees that have fled Ukraine total. NSA and U USA have also allowed special D visas in uh, many other countries for Ukrainians to have an extended visit in the United States without fear of the deportation. Those who stayed are in areas and metros turned bomb shelters. Uh, Slovakia, they announced Monday to give work to adults and school for kids to give a sense of normalcy for families fleeing. Uh, so allies. So pretty much the whole world is against Ukraine and those uh, who, uh, I mean, sorry. Oh man, sorry. So everyone in the world is with Ukraine and against uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, in, an, uh, in a UN council. Uh, I believe it was like 150 countries uh, compared to uh, five countries that voted to uh, put it uh, to uh, declare an end to this war, to ask Russia to declare an end to this war. The, of course, the ones that didn't vote for it also abstained from voting. So th there was no actual folks who were wanting to do this except for the Russians. So even the Russian allies are not on board with this invasion, but while at the same time not condemning them at the same time. So 
So far, NATO, EU, and the U.S. are freezing as many assets as they can in strict sanctions against Russia, which is why the ruble has fallen. Germany, who depends on natural resources and is one of the biggest uh, clients of their natural gas, have uh, made a drastic decision and something that could intentionally, uh, intentionally cause a lot of big collapses in their economy have decided to discontinue any uh, kind of connections with them as what. And of course, a side note, reports of Russian co uh, convoys rushing out, uh, running out of gas have been reported. A lot of abandoned uh, trucks in the convoys and a lot of different things like that. So there's a lot of uh, reports of uh, Russian um, um, soldiers just kind of being stranded at different points. Of course, as uh, Viola, oh, and then of course, one of the reports that they did an uh, interview with Viola Kramen, who's part of the uh, Ukrainian delegation in European, uh, said that we need to kick Putin's ass in an interview. So that was pretty funny. Uh, Poland, they have welcomed Ukrainians and have, of course, have a, has, have a history of, of using force to prevent other countries from coming in the past. Officials warns that the flow of refugees is likely to escalate into a full-blown humanitarian crisis, which clearly has become. Um, Hungary is one of the uh, point razor wire, so at one point had razor wire fences in the past have now opened their doors and are using churches to hold infill people. Uh, Belarus, which is to the north, is also, uh, is the Russia's friend and is hosting further talks between Russia and Ukraine and have uh, had many uh, Russian soldiers there as they're de being deployed from the north into Ukraine. President Zelensky of Ukraine will send officials to Belarus to talk. And uh, Monday is when they had their first talks. It didn't really go the way that they wanted to. Um, and then they're in the rounds of the second talks. And most people say that it's not going to happen. One of the big things that Ukraine is asking Russia to do, and even the world is asking, is to stop and turn back now. And then there can be really uh, some real talks going on forward. But for right now, it kind of feels like these talks are just a distraction. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Putin allies, China. China has not condoned Russia's actions, but has been very reluctant to join in EU sanctions. Uh, they refuse to call Ukraine an invasion, but have also refused to vote on anything related to the crisis. Beijing, which has fostered increasingly close ties with Moscow, has so far refused to condemn Russia outright and described its action as an invasion. China's state media has also adopted a pro-Russia viewpoint in its domestic coverage, while online posts in support of Ukraine and its president have been censored. So one of the things is that Chernobyl was also uh, one of the big sites in which uh, um, Russia has taken over as well. So um, w let's talk a little bit about nuclear since uh, pretty much as soon as the sanctions came in around the weekend, uh, uh, Putin announced pretty much like on Sunday earlier this week that there's going to be a nuclear deterrent if there's any kind of... Uh, uh, and of course, Russia has raised a stake against everyone else with threats to the West. Countries have supported Ukraine in sanctions towards Russia. Use sanctions and failing economy in Russia could be used as a tool to mobilize Russian people into a potential general war with Europe. The U.S. has tried to figure out a way to deter Putin in the Kremlin's attempts to force the EU and Western countries to blink. And so far, uh, at this point, it seems like Russia is not going to stop. I think in some ways in their own mind. I, I'm only speculating at this point. It, it kind of feels like they've gone too far without accomplishing something. So they want to be able to get something out of this. Of course, regardless of the outcome, Russia's ties with their countries will be pushed back for generations to come and perhaps will be, will be in a better place. I want, to, I, I want to think of a more optimistic kind of look to it, just kind of look at how close we are with uh, German, Germany and also uh, Japan as, you know, as soon as World War II ended. And you know, many of the years of re reconstruction, rebuilding with these countries, we have a better standing with Japan and Germany as a result. So maybe there's a, there's a potential, potential for the future with that, but I'm only speculating at this point. EU, EU, the European Union countries have raised their military budget and are either getting ready or supporting Ukraine. So a lot of them are definitely worried, especially with all the refugees coming into the humanitarian crisis. Um, so uh, Germany, uh, one of the things that have, uh, many people have noticed is that they've also increased their military budget, and they haven't, they've been really reluctant to do any kind of military actions at all, uh, especially after World War II. So they've been very uh, reluctant to do any kind of actions with that. But uh, as a result of what's happening now, they have pretty much doubled their budget in the military as a result. So the U.S. will be able, so let's talk about the U.S. and their military budget. So one of the things, it's not necessarily, uh, so the U.S. is kind of staying out of this for the most part. We're going to sanction the heck out of them, for, but uh, Biden has steadfast in saying that we're not going to have any American boots on the ground in Ukraine. 
uh, but he also mentioned that we're going to be bolstering up some of the defenses and the, the NATO allies around Ukraine. So one of the things is that they're just going to be like, we're, we're not going to not do anything, but we're not going to go so far as to get the boots on the ground, do a no-fly zone, and just kind of prevent any kind of thing that would uh, result in Russia's uh, uh, excuse to invade other countries and strike back and have that nuclear deterrent, which at this time, this is a very, very scary, very scary time, especially in an ongoing conflict, especially now that the, uh, in a way that we're all in it, in a way, because we started sanctioning them, so we're, we resulted. So we're not directly fighting them, uh, but we are indirectly fighting the Russians in a way, so it's kind of crazy. So let's talk about, um, so one of the uh, one of the also big uh, upsets and some of the ties that Russians are cutting is that Russia does provide military equipment to a lot of the countries like Germany and a lot of the close by countries as well. But now it seems like the U.S. military will be getting a lot more contracts. So there's a lot of potential for U.S. military to be selling government contracts and military contracts to a lot of these other countries uh, that Russia would have originally been doing. But now that the uh, so it's, 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 it's kind of interesting. There's a, there's a really cool video about this. It's called Real Life Lore, and it's on YouTube. It kind of explains uh, Ukraine and how it, it is involved with uh, not only European countries and how it, it relates to Russia. It is very, really deep, and I really do like it. I've been kind of talking a lot of this going on right now, but one of the things that kind of seems to be moving forward is that they are, tr it seems like Russia is strategically start, uh, uh, um, targeting um, infrastructure, so crippling the infra damage is already d being done and more to come. Government buildings, billions of dollars of repairs in Ukraine, most of the money are, may be come from humanitarian aid, hence the Western countries where they work to rebuild and spend billions of dollars to just to help get Ukraine back on their feet. Refugees in Ukraine much, uh, may cost other countries millions and cutting, oh, well, billions and cutting ties with Russia result in economic crisis across the globe. So like, how can we look to find a, uh, every possible way to de-escalate and have the right uh, path to ensure safety, not if not only for the Ukrainians, but even ensure the Russian people will not be associated with their leadership. So it's kind of weird because at the same time, there's uh, folks in Russia who are condemning it and also on social media. Like a lot of times the, uh, the war, the, in terms of the propaganda war, the, the Russians have technically failed on that front. Um, and you ev the support for Ukraine is pretty much overwhelming at this point. If you haven't already read the news, been watching the news and everything like that. But uh, one of the things uh, that was also addressed was the State of the Union. Earlier this week, Biden spoke about the American and Ukraine as he reassured American people, uh, primarily, primarily been opposed to war or direct conflict with Russian forces. Uh, the release of 60 million barrels of oil between 30 million of the US and 30 million in the, the European Union uh, told big business to stop inflating the marketplace and getting things back to normal, COVID-19. Uh, well, right now, they're not, uh, I they don't care too much about wearing masks, but they want to in invest in getting, helping people who are getting sick and helping with uh, treatments. Uh, $22 billion pitch for Congress. GOP wants the receipts from previous relief money. Here we go again. Uh, of course, uh, one of the things that he also mentioned that we're going to be building more manufacturing jobs, including uh, semiconductor farms in like Ohio and also electric vehicles. There's just a lot of information in this uh, speech as well. But let's talk a little bit about hindsight. And it's something that I've kind of been constantly like, it kind of feels like we've been going in this circle, this constant thing about, you know, pointing blame and saying that these people are terrible and then they becoming terrible as a result. So U.S. and allies have created a series of great relationships post-World War II with enemies. Japan and Germany, like I said before, is one of our best allies and have a rich culture to offer the world. Xenophobia, Cold War, Iron Curtain, Vietnam, Korean War, Afghanistan, they suck, USA, USA. Uh, it's, just, it's just so crazy just how much history often traces the map to where it has been laid down for groundwork and these tensions we deal with today um, and continuing on these sanctions is also going to treat. So if we keep treating people like the enemy, we shouldn't be surprised when they become one. And that's what I want to kind of leave you guys on for my news report. So there, it, it was definitely engaged and to kind of go a little bit deeper and I totally got off topic. It kind of felt like you're talking, you're listening to a guy with ADHD. So I'm going to stop it right there. And I want to um, move on over to a 
an, a clip for you guys. This is a clip made by one of our Saturday Dropping Kids, but also at the very end we'll have a promo for any, any kids or any family who has a, a young kid between the ages of 8 and 14, and they want their kid to do something during the spring break. So without further ado, here's this video, and when I come back, I'm going to prejudge a movie during Pre-Critic. Okay, well, I don't know why that video did not play. Oh, weird. Okay, so anyways, uh, here we go. This March 21st through the 25th. While spring break lets your kids out, you can drop them off here at MCAT. From 10 to 3, your kid gets to use many of our resources to create and share their own stories. For kids age 8 to 14, a fun break from their spring break. Spring Flicks. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It is another big weekend as we've been pushing those movies back and forth. Now we're getting the titular the Batman. Yes, the first time ever in theaters is that you get a chance to watch The Batman for the first time in live action. For the very first time, you get to see a live action actor portray the part as of Bruce Wayne and The Batman. Anybody who is anybody will probably see this movie because Batman kids keep getting grittier and grittier to the point of pure emo heavy metal violence that keeps us miss the outside underwear. This basically is about the Riddler and how he keeps Gotham under his thumb. And this one is geared towards a gritty version of the Riddler and company. I'm assuming um, they'll often refer to many characters as their alter egos and only mention in passing or throw the line of what they should be calling them. Anyways, they try to create a world of cloak and dagger or cloud and uh, cowl in this prestige film about a vigilante taking crime into his own hands. We're going to have to watch it anyways because uh, they make more money and, you know, they, they just keep making money for these movies. So they're going to keep making those movies. It just, it just makes sense. Uh, up next, we got A Day to Die. Bruce Willis is back again for his uh, 20th movie in the last year. Uh, in, a, in a basically a John McClane sounding movie, A Day to Die, but also sounds like a James Bond film, but with a bunch of hard parts. So guess what? A generic action fl flick starring Bruce Willis and Chinese propagandist goes go to Frank Grillo. Bruce Willis plays a corrupt police chief slash protector of politician or whatever as you know as all have to team up to fight the syndicate in some short uh, sort of action movie anyways the main guy not either actor have has to get uh, away from bigger actors to give this action movie some street cred needed to sell the film like this anyways so they need to get two million dollars in less than 24 hours before this guy's family is killed it's every 90s movie that you could ever dream of finally we got a great freedom. World War II, great. Diversity, wonderful. Before the last guy gets out of jail, let's spend another movie in jail called The Great Freedom. World War II, check. Finding, fighting for your right to live, check. Uh, covering the homosexual populations during Nazi Germany, wow. Haven't really seen these kind of things, but however, this movie actually takes place in a post-world Germany. While some folks were freed, this guy was not because he's gay. Hans, the main guy, must figure out a way to get out while being true to himself and trying to get, uh, trying to go for Oscar gold. Um, his partner slash cellmate has his own problems with being a former Nazi and killer of many. Um, German soldiers versus Nazi is a very fine line in those days. So uh, that's the kind of movie that is coming out this the, the, that weekend, which I'm pretty sure you'll all ignore because <laughs> the Batman's out. So that's about that. I do have a brand new dub and stuff for you guys. It's from the crime noir film from 1950, The File on Thelma Jordan. And then when I come back, we're going to talk about some um, art in downtown Missoula. Well, Thelma, I got some bad news for you. We're in the 1950s noir film. I should have known. The creator just war loves noir films. More noir films. Okay, okay. And Vinny Vito, not even trying to do a special voice of any kind. What the hell are you trying to do? You're just doing the same old basic voice. Now listen voice. here, ma'am. I'm just trying to do my best, the best that I possibly can, trying to read these lips. Uh, stop it. Just watch the movie. You know what? Maybe you're right. Uh, never mind. You married to that person. Admit it. Uh, don't change the subject. You did the murdering. I'm just trying to phone this thing in. Can't you tell? Nah. 
Not really. Hmm. Perhaps I've been phoning it in the whole time. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Quit being so dramatic. After all, this is drama and crime and all sorts of things, so... Actually, never mind. Forget what I just said. Be as dramatic as you possibly can. I'm gonna sit down. Do you mind? Well, I don't know anything about nothing. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? I don't know anything what happened to that lady. Oh, well, you know, there's, uh, you know, evidence and all sorts of police work going on right now, so if you want to tell me right now, maybe we can work out a deal. Deal? What kind of deal are you talking about? Well, listen, Thelma. Your name is Thelma, right? Because that's the name of this video. It's named after the titular character, so you're Thelma, right? Maybe one time, but right now I just... I... I'm trying to help you, Thelma. Oh, jeez. When did it get so dramatic all of a sudden? When did you get so good at acting? This isn't the time to lose your mind. And what did I say about photos? I'm not photo ready. Quit taking photos over there, okay? I'm going to say something that de-escalates situations. Quit acting like a crazy person. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. I'm not telling you anything, okay? Listen, being arrested and not being arrested depends upon your cooperation. Okay, please, just... There is a high chance that you might have been involved in the murder. So therefore, I have to lock you in prison unless you cooperate with I me. I said okay. Maybe... I'll tell you everything. Well, don't make it too easy on me. I get... I get paid by the hour. I'm not a salary man. Well, then... Why don't you join a police union or something like that? Huh, what are you, some kind of pinko spy or something like that? Unions are directly tied with communism. <laughs> they basically help bolster up the worker. I think I've heard enough of this. I need answers. It was late night. I had a couple drinks. Just harmless fun. Ha ha ha. Just all whole sorts of fun. Ha ha ha. How often does one get a party at a mansion? Uh, I was actually trying to wonder about um, starting a police union in town. And then town. things just got out of hand. Wait, what did you just say? Um, well, don't tell the other cops, but... I was really thinking about starting a union. Oh, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Wait there, okay? Shh, shh. Hmm. What seems to be going on in here? Well, that man was interrogating me, and he was doing a great job. He's a great cop. I see. Well, let me tell you there, sister. I am not that nice of a cop. Perhaps maybe we can work something out. You can tell me what really well, happened. I've been trying to tell them, but... Oh, it's no use. She's not being cooperative. We have to do things. Oh, this is weird. What, I'm trying to be... Well, you've never heard of good cop, confusing cop? Congratulations. Welcome to the party, lady. Where I am... Me, huh? sir. I can vouch for this lady. She was at the party and she stayed well in sight. I know that because she was stuffing shrimp in her purse. Oh, this is America? Don't judge. Well, perhaps you're right after all. I think this woman's been through quite enough this night. The old lady of the manor is dead. She's just kind of left behind to take the blame. I'm pretty sure she didn't do anything. I saw. I think that's the... enough. Ooh. Ooh? Well, I guess I'll just be uh, on my way then, if it's okay. Yeah, you're okay. Go on now. Oh, that it? Yeah. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some city council stuff. Hey, the city did have a, a city council meeting on the 28th. It was the last uh, Monday of the month, but it was a short month, so it was uh, having to be done just because uh, President's Day was the, follow the previous Monday, so I have a lot to talk about. They approved a series of agenda items, and we'll jump into public comment right now. Jim Parker, 350 uh, Montana is an environmental group, talks about the city's ongoing work with uh, zero by 50. So here's what uh, Jim Parker had to say. No country is doing enough or doing it fast enough, including the state of Montana. To that point, I have concerns with actions of one of your partners to Missoula's clean electricity resolution, Northwestern Energy. I've not seen any real changes by that corporation since the resolution passed and fundamentally changed their responses to the growing climate chaos we're seeing with summer and now winter wildfires and smoke which both hurts our tourism economy and threatens citizens with health issues from smoke inhalation. Mega droughts hitting our agricultural sector and rivers getting less snowpack, renewal, warming earlier, and killing fish and our recreational economy. 
Okay, so uh, let's go. So far, uh, you know, the, the very real issues that have been impacting Montana in the last couple of years is drought. And it's mostly our eastern farmers who have the record droughts from 2019 to 2021. So the most severe drought in decades with another one on the horizon. This year was supposed to be another one of those El Nino kind of a uh, heavy precipitation years, but uh, uh, back in the, uh, but we have not seen a lot of those numbers shown up w uh, with any intense winter weather snowfall. And there's not much going on for much of March. It uh, looks like today is even going to be a beautiful day in the early months of the March, which I do remember even from growing up in Missoula is that winter tends to last a little bit well into March. But the numbers are available on drought.gov, which have been monitor monitoring Missoula's dry trends since 2000 on a weekly basis. So let's move on. At the end of Monday's meeting, nothing much happened except for the updating the budget to reflect new grants, money, and other spending opportunities. So far, some of the spark notes is that uh, John Engen read a proclamation recognizes Missoula's part in black American culture from Missoula's past, the good, the bad, and everything in between for Black History Month. Um, at the end of this meeting, John Kantos spoke about the Ukrainian crisis. So we're going to drop back into that. I'm totally impressed with uh, the president over there. Uh, during the law school, just his, he had the opportunity to leave the country, he swept away, and he refused and stayed. And I think as a result, uh, it's done a lot for the people over there just to stand up and take on this situation. And I was really impressed with his uh, example, his character. And it just made me realize that when uh, you step into situations that are hard, um, it inspires lots of other people. But uh, a lot of prayer really needed for that situation, and I believe it's going to work out for the best. Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, let's jump right into Mike Nugent, who spoke about housing stock in Missoula and how some of the information was unclear via social media. So this is uh, Mike Nugent talking about the housing stock in Missoula. People sharing on social media are equating that there were 1,338 new single-family homes approved um, in the county year 2021. And that number actually is broken down um, much in much greater detail. So what of that number, 1,064 were multi-dwelling apartments, for example, 130 were single dwelling detached. Um, and I think that that for some reason referring to every unit as a home confuses people, which is unfortunate and should not. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning that just to make sure that people are using accurate information when they're having a conversation like this. Yep. And so just to go back on uh, harp on a little bit more on that, the uh, concept of dwelling units are constantly being used uh, to regard housing, apartments, condos more. Um, at the end of the meeting uh, is a way for council to address things not on the agenda and respond to comments during city council meeting. Amber Sherrill spoke about MCPS repealing the mask mandate in schools, and this is what she said. So today was the first day that MCPS, um, the, the students of MCPS went to school without a mask mandate. It has been almost two full years um, that they've been in masks at school. And I, I just, I'm feeling, I'm feeling very kind of celebratory about our numbers right now. I'm always feeling like I'm holding my breath about it, but I, I think that our community is going in the right direction on this. And um, just, I, I wanna, give my thanks to everyone that, that has done their best to make this thing as fast as possible, even though it was two full years. So I'm, I'm glad we're where we are. All right, so I do wanna bring up an uh, informational page for you guys just so you can find out more information. You go to missoulainfo.com. So I'll bring up that page, missoulainfo.com. You, well, you can Google it too, but this is the page that'll be brought up. You can always go to, does it pop up? You go to data, which is located at the top right hand corner, click on that, and it gives you uh, a lot of options and a lot of things like that. I always go for the data dashboard, which is the second from the left, click on that, and it gives you the most recent up to date numbers by age, by groups, you know, 27 new cases, 172 active cases, 201 accumulated deaths in the last two years. Um, then you see a lot of the numbers, the daily positivity rate, which is about seven people a day. Um, and, and it has seriously decreased from about uh, 100 a day when we, we, when we 
you started out earlier in the September and earlier parts of the year as well. So it was kind of crazy for sure. There was uh, a seven day average of 312 people on January 30th, and now we're really far down to about seven people. So I think that's really cool. Uh, moving on, um, oh wow, even less than what I said is the uh, Missoula hospitalization. There's four people uh, hospitalized currently and their non-county residents currently hospitalized. Uh, average number of Missoula County residents hospitals in the last seven days is seven. So hospitalizations are really down low. Um, so yeah, seeing a lot of good numbers and a lot of things as well moving forward. Breakthrough versus unvaccinated disease uh, severity and just seeing a lot of those numbers right there. So MissoulaInfo.com is where you can get your latest information on that. Um, they also have a masking on February 25th. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control uh, updated its mask guidelines for the nation. The new CDC guidelines is determined by the proportion of COVID number patients, the number of new co COVID hospitalizations per 100,000, and the numbers of cases per 100,000 people. So if there's fewer than 200 cases per 100,000 in the last seven days and fewer than 10 new hospitalizations in the last in the, per 100,000 in the last seven days, is considered low in terms of COVID patients. So they really raised up the number. I remember back earlier in the day, it was like 20 new cases a week for per 100,000 people was considered high, but now it's uh, we're considered low if it's at the 200 people. So it's 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 guiding more towards uh, relieving the hospitals as well moving forward. So a little side note on that, but of course, like I said. Uh, showed earlier, talked a little bit about the CDC as we go into my news report, my lengthy news report, but let's jump right back into City Council as this is where they are going to be talking about the end of the Carlisle um, trial. So the, uh, the, the lawsuit against Carlisle, which basically uh, so much money but it has been uh, passed between uh, the acquisition of our water company. Uh, it's, it's been an ongoing thing for many, 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 many years, and the legal battle against Carlisle Group will be voted to settle for $4.13 million, all to cover the legal fees and the water combination committees, the set price trial, and the further litigation costs for the Missoulians in a huff. But Missoula's effort have resulted in a way to recoup costs of the $4.13 million. So we're going to be getting those $4.13 $4 million going towards our water system and improving the water system as well. So John Engen talks about wrapping up our legal battles, and here is John Engen. Uh, our claim by the city of Missoula that, uh, that Carlisle acted in bad faith, um, and in doing so um, uh, made the acquisition of uh, uh, Missoula water more expensive than it needed to be. We pursued that claim uh, through an arbitration panel, uh, working with uh, the attorney team who successfully uh, navigated and uh, won our condemnation case um, and, uh, and allowed us to uh, ultimately purchase the water system. Um, those attorneys worked on a contingent basis uh, and were not paid, but they believed so much in this case um, that they were willing to take that risk along with the city of Missoula. All right. Oh, sorry about that last one. Okay, let me find that one. Critics, of course, you know, one of the biggest critics uh, of the further litigation felt like the trial should have ended as soon as we got the water company and suing them further would have been like a divorce lawyer convincing one side to preserve further actions. However, this, as time went on, the trial ended in a settlement around that $14.13 million and city officials said that would cover the legal fees and wash the hands of Carlisle once and for all. Uh, John Ingen reflects on the settlement and this is what he had to say. Um, what this uh, settlement does is uh, allows us to move forward. It allows us to do it um, at a cost that uh, that the water utility can absorb over time. Uh, there will be uh, no consequence to ratepayers. That is, if you uh, are a Missoula water customer, um, you won't see an increase in your bill as a function of this settlement agreement. Okay, and that's one of the things that he definitely wanted to harp on is that the city of Missoula will not be paying any extra fees for this, but a rate increase is uh, because the, there hasn't been a rate increase in the city of Missoula since 2014, so that rate increase had nothing to do with the litigation, and the city hired the third party to consult to determine the best course moving forward. So far, Missoula will be working with an additional uh, $319,000 a year for the next 20 years from the settlement worth 12 
to $14 million costs in saving, but it's also nice to have some extra change for investing in our broken water system. So we bought a broken water system for more than it was worth, and now we're just dealing with it. So let's talk about some community meetings uh, before we go on there, because one of the big things is that the city is considering buying Marshall Mountain, one of the uh, older old school ski resorts, which were very popular well until it closed in 2002. Parks and Conservation, some of the open space bond money uh, uh, towards public acquisition of Marshall Mountain, which in 2002 was the last year it was considered a full-fledged ski slope. Um, over the last years, businesses' interests have tried, come in and out, and so unable to make money, and uh, the city of Missoula have leased the property for the last for a 10-month lease and uh, have released a survey to ask households, um, and 71% of households are in favor with a emphasis of 47% are strongly in favor of those 71%. So, and even um, less people are, in, are uh, disinterested in it. So kicking off things is Morgan Valiant from the city of Missoula, and he's worked with a lot of open space bonds, and this is what he had to say. Uh, Marshall Mountain was an old ski area about five miles northeast of Missoula. It closed in 2003. Um, here's a map of generally these three parcels that you see here uh, comprise the old ski area. Of course, it's surrounded by federal land. That's all these areas in green. Uh, in general, uh, the property is split up into three parcels. The base area property, which is 160 acres and is currently owned by Izzy Dog LLC. Uh, the Mid Mountain parcel, which is also 160 acres, that's owned by Five Valleys Land Trust. And then about 100 acres that are in an old uh, ski area special use permit with the Forest Service. Um, the city currently has uh, 10 to 16 months left in a lease agreement with an option to buy the base area and we also um, are in negotiations, uh, very positive negotiations with Five Valleys Land Trust on including uh, the 160 acre Five Valleys Mid-Mountain parcel um, in the entire um, acquisition that the city would, would hopefully do. All right, so uh, one of the big things uh, that they want to do is they want to determine what they're gonna do with the property. So right now, the purpose right now is to come up with a master plan. So they wanna spend about $180,000 um, to see what the potential of this property is. They're going to have different uh, uh, looks and different uh, feelings of this. And uh, first of all, the survey was made back in 2018, and as a result, nearly 70% were in favor of some kind of uh, use of the Marshall Mountain with 47% strongly and the other somewhat, while only 15% outright said no. Uh, Nathan McLeod reflects on community involvement and how a lot of people in the community and also the nonprofit Friends of Marshall Mountain are moving forward with... Uh, acquisition. And so this document is on engagemissoula.com. It's available in some draft format right now. Um, it includes over 70 pages of public comment. So if you're going to get in there, make sure you have a, an hour or so to read through it. Um, so we started this uh, with a series of targeted stakeholder meetings where we had 93 participants from a variety of organizations that came together to provide their input on what Marshall should be. Um, following this stakeholder brainstorming session, we used Engage Missoula to provide the information about the project and included an online survey. Uh, this slide is actually a little bit off. Uh, I just found out that our total reach of the project online was over 6,000 people um, and included over 1,300 people that actually filled out the survey. Um, so this far and away uh, exceeds anything that the city has had on Engage Missoula to this uh, to this date, um, with the next highest participation rate being the Community Housing Use Assessment in 2021, which had a little more than 700 participants. So one of the things that I, I'm definitely noticing about Missoula and the engagement of the people in Missoula is that even with the uh, grand master plan of our Missoula, there was a, a good amount of people who had a lot of input in how they wanted Missoula to grow in the first place, and even more people with this particular project. So there's a lot of things moving, for, uh, right, uh, moving forward right now. Um, Engage Missoula is a great source to have your opinions in real time and a great place for families and community events. So far, Missoula will have a public input for the plans for the future of Marshall Mountain. To learn more, you can look up Friends of Marshall Mountain. Morgan came back to talk uh, about the situation that is buying the mountain before we have a plan for the site. So this is what he had to say. You know, we, we certainly know what it's going to cost to acquire the mountain. We do not know what it's going to cost to build. And we also do not know what we're going to build. Those are critical questions that we have to answer in order to, 
that stimulate people to give money to this project? Those are the number two question, uh, number one and two questions that come out of folks when you ask them for money. Well, what are you going to do with the money? Um, so in general, between March and August, uh, this spring and through the summer, we are really going to be focused on that master plan. The fundraising campaign is really going get, to get going uh, with friends in Marshall Mountain. We are going to continue to have thousands of people visit the mountain. Our av daily average that we've been logging through last year was about 43 uh, people a day. Um, we do have several large events planned, large national mountain bike races that are coming to town. Um, lots of kids camps uh, are going to be using this, uh, both within our Park Swim Rec program and uh, within the broader community. Okay, so there's definitely a lot of potential for this open space, uh, and they want to look into using some of the open space bonds to get it uh, paid for. So the total cost of the site is $1.8 million of planning costing of the $130,000 from the open space bond. That money will be raised by, the, uh, and then additional money for the purchase will be uh, raised by the Friends of Marshall Mountain and trying to, to fit the right pieces in the right places. Um, Amber Sherrill from City Council reflects on this particular opportunity, and this is what she had to say. As Morgan pointed out, that we, we decided we were going to put money aside for a special project, for, you know, a rainy day fund, for an opportunity fund is kind of how I think about it. And I think this is a perfect use of that money because it is an opportunity. And, um, you know, the timing, I, I want to add as well with, you know, from what John had said, the timing of this um, you know, being a fundraiser for many, many years, you can't just go to someone and say, we've got this great idea in our head that we want to fund and we want you to give us money. It doesn't work that way. You need to have a really solid plan going forward. So I do believe that, um, you know, that getting this done using what I'm going to call those opportunity funds that are already put away um, for something like this and um, is going to only help in saving money in the long run as far as, uh, you know, letting the, um, the group fundraise effectively. We always All right. That. So uh, that was Amber, Amber Sherrill talking a little more about this. Um, I also wanted to think about it in terms of how the city used uh, COVID relief money to purchase the Sleepy Inn Motel. We were using that as a source for people to, uh, who have no homes and who also and, uh, look kind of those live-in facilities to uh, separate and quarantine during those times. But pretty much um, the Sleepy Inn Motel on that site and the area around the Broadway is going to be part of the West Broadway Master Plan. So the potential for that site has uh, been uh, great in terms of investment for the city of Missoula and also moving forward with a potential new uh, West Broadway corridor. So there's not, I'm not saying that Marshall Mountain has that kind of potential, but I'm also saying this that uh, with the purchase of that land, it seems to a uh, uh, rising tide raises all ships kind of deal with that. So Morgan Valiant talks about how important it is to have a master plan that reflects community input. And so this is my last quote. We need to get the area prepared for uh, the public uh, and for to handle the, the vision that has been set out there. But where will we land on that spectrum? Will it be currently like it is now, like a trailhead at the end of a dirt road? Or will there be, you know, a public-private partnership where someone's managing a coffee shop or bar or event center at the base? And so really taking that time to fully vet out the vision, having those actual costs for what it's going to cost to build and then what it's gonna to cost to operate it and maintain it. And so this master plan will give us the tools to properly vet this project and to actively fundraise to acquire and build the property. Okay, so that's that's the deal. That's the, that's the whole spiel. That's uh, part of the presentation. You guys can check that out by going on to Parks and Conservation's committee meeting through the city of Missoula at ci.missoula.mt.us. Again, that website is ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful, website for you to find out more information about what the city is up to, what the city is doing in upcoming meetings and agenda items. Once again, ci.missoula.mt.us, everything you need to know about Missoula in terms of getting involved with your local government. Cool, we good, we good? Okay, cool, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about uh, art. But before we jump right into art, I wanted to emphasize uh, within and without uh, being featured at the Missoula Art Museum um, right now.
Hey guys, welcome back. Let's kick things off with your first art installation happening at Clay Studio of Missoula. It is called Reception at Clay, no, no, it's Community Exhibition. So this popular exhibition showcases the diverse and exciting time works created by Clay Studio of Missoula students, members, and studio artists. They'll feature a range of works created by over 30 uh, participating artists, including, but not limited to large sculpture, mixed media pieces, wall works, hand-built vessels, and functional wheel thro thrown forms. And this uh, Clay Studio of Missoula is located near Lowell School in the uh, kind of like the off Scott Street part uh, in Missoula, Montana. And this exhibit, it goes on from 5 to 8 p.m. And just so you guys know, uh, uh, due to the current high COVID transmission rates, make masks are required inside the Clay Studio of Missoula for safety of the community. The gallery is fairly small, so they just want to be a little bit more careful at the time at the same time they, but they're not really pushing for it just be a little bit uh, mindful of other people um, embellishment paintings and sankey um, gallery 709 inside the montana art and flaming presents embellishments painting and Pisanki. Ugh, i'm off obviously butchering that so this happens in all month long and it's going to be open from 9 p.m. and this is at the 709 Gallery 709, which is also located at 709 Ronan Street. Uh, call uh, 541-7100. Numbers uh, uh, 541-7100. Um, MontanaArt.com for the website. Barbara Morrison has created many colorful images and paintings done with a gauche watercolor and mixed media sculptures, including tiny rabbits and ducks. Ukrainian Pisinski style. Uh, decorated eggs by Kathy and Bob Howlett, uh, uh, Judy Dun Donovan, and Barbara Morrison will also be on display. So get some beautiful artwork up there. We got the artist shop is uh, featuring Jenna Forrest, uh, um, watercolor, acrylic painting, and wood stain. This collection is meant to convey through a symbolic relation symbiotic relationship with wood and flame, an interpretation of the land and how in its very natural, raw, yet re uh, refined by purposeful design. So that's what's happening at the artist shop. Um, this is going to be at the University of Montana. This is a big show. The University uh, Center Gallery at, Nor uh, at the University of Montana will explore the impact of change with a new jury ex exhibition titled Not the World We Used to Know. Um, and this actually opens at 4 p.m., a little bit earlier than regular First Friday events, but it uh, closes at 7 p.m. So this might be one, be your first stops at the University of Montana. I believe it's the Museum of uh, Modern Art and Culture, and it's located in the Part TV building. With works by students, staff, facility, and alumni of the UM and Missoula College, the show opens mo um, February 28th with an awards reception held from 4 to 7 p.m. tonight. Friday, March 4th, the exhibition will be on display through April 8th. Um, we got Radius Gallery featuring Trespasses is thrilled to present a new works by two brilliantly talented Montana-based artists, Maggie Hiltner and also Shailene Venezuela. Uh, so they do textile composition and slip cast ceramics, sharply observed and culturally attuned. Each artist uses their works to explore the critique, social norms, and expectations, illuminating life's un undertones with wit and insight. Finally, we got Aria Health. Join us for an evening in art and grand opening of Aria Health. This first Friday event will be featured local artists Frankie McCormick and uh, Mickey Haldy, refreshments by Western Cider, and more located at 206 South 3rd Street uh, West. It's near, near Bernice's Bakery off of the Hip Strip, so you guys can check that out. Brand, brand opening as part of their first Friday art gallery. So you guys can enjoy some of that stuff and more. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can go to MissoulaEvents.net. And speaking of Missoula Events, I do have a little bit of time, so I'm going to kind of gloss on these. Here at the library, there's always ongoing classes and fun stuff. Um, what's happening is uh, that the partners do a lot of events. Uh, Spectrum Discovery Center has the Science Labs, opens at 10 a.m., and they do this all week long for a lot of kids to get engaged with STEM learning. Uh, uh, MCAT has our Photoshop slash um, Adobe Premiere editing in the afternoon at 3 and at 4. This afternoon, you can RSVP by calling us at 542-6228, otherwise known as 542-MCAT. Uh, you can also go to MCAT.org or the Missoula's uh, Public Library's website for more information about these events. Tiny Tales and Storytime are happening tonight and tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. We're just kind of going into the overview of what's happening here at the library. Uh, one of the things I also wanted to mention, it is the birthday of Families First Learning Lab. They're turning 28 years old. Families First Learning Lab is a, a, per, a parenting kind of a support group 
uh, bent on helping parents have better relationships with their children and figure out ways to be better parents themselves. So this is, they're doing their happy birthdays for families first, uh, starting at noon today here at the public library. So wish them a happy birthday. They're 28. Um, they can rent a car and stuff. Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, learn video editing with Adobe Premiere here at MCAT at Public Library and Photoshop as well. We, this is ongoing events that happen every single Friday, except for the birthday. Um, if you're interested in going out and about tonight, there you have the D&D Guild for Adults here at the Missoula Public Library starting at 6 p.m. It is online, and you can find the link at missoulaevents.net. Brother Ali will be at the Wilma Theater, and they're going to be performing starting at 7 p.m. emo night at Missoula, uh, the Zootown Arts Community Center. So if you're feeling emo or nostalgic for being emo, you can go back there 7 p.m. tonight at the Zootown Arts Community Center. It's a wonderful place to do that and listen to some great music um, by Blink-182, I assume. <laughs> Uh, Tickle My Fancy is going to be at uh, Monks at 8 p.m. Um, and that's what's going to happen on those days. Uh, Saturday, they're doing those uh, markets from 9 to 1 p.m. at the Orchard Homes and also the uh, Winter Valley Market at the Southgate Mall. Wood Brothers is going to, actually, that's probably at 7 p.m., so I'll talk about that later. Uh, statewide Financial Skill Building Class. Homeward does a lot of classes, but this is one of their classes that goes from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Most of the time it's full, but this is an online Zoom classes so that you might be able to get in on this there as well. It's statewide financial skill building classes and figuring out ways so uh, if you're struggling with finances, they help you uh, with these classes. This is a nonprofit. I believe it's about a $35 or so to get into these kind of trainings, but you can leave with a certificate that has many opportunities for grants and opportunities for being first time home buyers and more. So it's a wonderful opportunity with that. And if you want to learn more, you can go to homeward.org. Uh, MCAT tour and training it happens on Saturdays and Mondays, um, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and also Saturday night, uh, uh, Monday, sorry, Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. and Monday nights at 5.30 p.m. To learn more information, go to MCAT.org. Again, if you are interested in uh, producing a show or doing your own thing here on MCAT, you can go to MCAT.org. You can call us at 542-6228 to inquire more information about that. But I have to end my show, and I wanted to thank you guys for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott.